This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. It's Fun Friday. My name is Jeff Sandu. Disruption has been one of Matt's favourite MSP topics of the year. And I've lost count the number of times he's complained about the twin cults of disruption and innovation. So today, we're looking at the flip sides of disruption and innovation. Us, the people who maintain society. So Matt, where does this idea of the maintainers come from? Hey, Jeff. Well, it was something that I was reading online. At New Scientist? Uh, no, no. Actually, you're wrong this time. Um, see, I do have more than one source <laughs> of information. No, it's a site called uh, City Lab. Um, it's such a really cool site. It's one of the Atlantic's partner sites. Mm-hmm. And it talks about the technologies and cultural movements that are shaping the cities of the future. So they wrote an article about a group of academics who have started a website and a conference called, oddly enough, The Maintainers. (laughs) You can find it at themaintainers.org. And it's really something for the rest of us, you know, the people who live at the other end, the receiving end of the innovation and disruption curve. The ones who do nothing. Well, thank you for that provocative question. But, you know, why do we have this idea that unless you're a visionary, you don't do anything worthwhile? Mm. So, yeah, you know, we talk about all the people who move fast and break stuff. But the problem with that is that someone has to try and put that broken society (laughs) back together again. Uh, And, you know, I don't want to bang on the obvious drum, but when you go online, you see how polarized people are, how set in their ways they are. Even the most innocuous comments are taken out of context. Mm. And people experience the, the the real strange weight of these social media pylons. And, you know, I've had one or two myself. Yeah, is that because you're seen as being outspokenly anti-child? Weirdly, no one seems <laughs> to mind that one so much. Um, probably because they think everyone else's kids are hellspawn. And they are right, with the exception of the exception of their own kids. Um, now, you know, I don't want to revisit those moments, mm. but this idea of breaking stuff seems to have infected our consciousness, you know, way beyond what we see in in our kind of daily lives. Are we heading back to the faker score from a couple of weeks ago? Well, we're not quite in the same area, although I suppose you could see these episodes as being complementary to each other. So I'll try and avoid talking about the status quo too much. Um, Coming back to those maintainers, You know, they are the 99.9% of people who aren't engaged in messing things up. Uh, They're the people who are either working within these innovative and disruptive companies to try and make the crazy ideas work. Um, But mostly they're the rest of us who are doing things that aren't classed as disruptive or innovative, Mm. but are actually essential for the functioning of society. Who exactly do you mean? Uh, Well, I'm going to use a broader definition than the folks who've come up with the maintainers website. I don't think they're trying to be exclusive in any way, but, you know, theirs is essentially a networking and resource sharing site. So in a way, they're activist (laughs) maintainers, if you want. Uh, The majority of people, I think the quiet maintainers are just happy to go about their lives. So why do we need to shine a spotlight on these quiet maintainers? If they're just going about their lives, they may not want it, right? Well, when we look at the kind of top-down approach that the media, including me, often (laughs) takes, you know, we prioritise the so-called visionaries and innovative uh, innovators, rather, the Gateses and the Jobses and the Musks. And then there are the wannabe gurus like Elizabeth Holmes Mm. and, of course, Adam Newman. Mm -hmm. And that brings us certain problems. You know, of all the names I mentioned, I think the only one who comes close to having a widescreen rather than a tunnel vision of that future is Bill Gates. Mm. Because, you know, let's be in no doubt, all of these people are pitching us their view of the future, a view of the future from their perspective. No Facebook or Twitter? Well, you can't deny the disruption that those companies have created. (laughs) Uh, I think of the two, Twitter is probably the more genuinely innovative Mm. idea. Mm. Uh, You know, the idea of quick fire, open platform communication, uh, text messaging to the masses, while Facebook was always a bit more conservative, (laughs) uh, much more of a friendster that you actually (laughs) wanted to spend time on. Um, But Twitter especially is an example of this kind of blind innovation. What can happen when great ideas kind of run amok? Uh, That tool that we hoped would spread democracy has ended up with problems like trolling and fake news threatening to engulf it. Mm. No matter how good the intentions of the innovators, 
inventions always have consequences and they're often unforeseen ones. Isn't that part of shaping the future, taking those risks? Well, yes, it is. But, you know, who bears responsibility or who bears the brunt of those risks? Mm. You know, we also spend a lot of time on this show mocking fake <laughs> and useless innovation like the smart salt cellar that <laughs> tracks your sodium intake or the smart hairbrush that counts the number and intensity of your brush strokes. And this year's tone deaf champion, <laughs> the Google paper phone, which we covered on Geeks a couple of weeks ago. Uh, of course, that is a square of folded paper designed to free you of your online addictions, or as those of us without quantum fingers call it, a notebook or journal. Uh, not all innovation is created equal. Which is where the rest of us come in as maintainers. Well, yeah, pretty much. You know, that's the thing, as I said, with moving fast and breaking stuff. You don't see the mess and the chaos that you leave in your wake because mm. you've already moved on. And these things always become somebody else's problem. Um, but, you know, like a gang of kids who empty garbage cans <laughs> into your front garden and run off, it's up to the rest of us to clean up after them. And that's where we start to develop these disparities. After all these shows, are you really going to say that change isn't good? Well, no, of course not. You know, I'm, but I'm always happy to own my own hypocrisies. Hmm. Um, wanting to eat less meat or fast food, but absolutely loving hamburgers and fries. I'm actually massively restricting my carbs right now, which is making <laughs> me really grumpy. And just saying the word fries is actually making me salivate. You're on a diet? Um no, I'm taking active steps to change my diet. The positive steps I undertook in 2018 <laughs> have largely gone backwards in 2019. <laughs> so I'm actually going back to what was working. Isn't that a form of disruption? That's a very clever segue. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's the point. I can't just say, hey, I'm just going to eat celery and nothing else. Mm. Yes, I'll lose weight fast, but I'm going to get sick at the same time. You can't just disrupt. I have to maintain the rest of my my system, the bits that need sugars and fats and vitamins <laughs> and nutrients to function. And did I mention sugars and fats? Um, so, yeah, you know, there's nothing wrong with disruption. But when we talk about food and exercise, disrupting our normal habits in both the short and long term can have positive effects. But it can also have unintended negative consequences as well. You were about to say, and that's nothing new, aren't you? I was. You know, we like to pretend that the world we live in is so different from everything else that came before it, but it isn't. And when we focus on the innovation and the innovators, we focus on the changes and not on the things that have actually stayed the same. You know, when I look around my living room, there are a few things that have changed in the digital era, but the majority of them haven't. You know, floor tiles, wallpaper, rugs, sinks, toilets. You have sinks and toilets in your living room? You kind of know <laughs> what I'm getting at. You know, coffee table, TV, lamp, <laughs> sofa, chair. You, right. you know what I mean? If you went back 30 years to 1989, you'd find similar items in most people's homes. Those things have all improved by degrees or in some cases, not at all. Some things like tables aren't crying out for innovation. Mm. But when we focus on the innovation and the innovators, it gives the idea that our life is in a much greater state of flux, when in fact, it might actually be in a state of atrophy rather than improvement. In what sense? Well, look at national infrastructure, for example, uh, especially in developed economies where the infrastructure is often older than in emerging economies. You have this weird dichotomy where you're using Waze or Google Maps, mm. you know, this high tech new digital technology to guide your all new electric crossover or hybrid to your destination. But you're driving along crumbling roads and bridges. You know, we can rush through experimental vaccines for diseases like Ebola, and this isn't in any way a complaint, by the way. Um, yet we're looking at an antibiotic apocalypse where replacements could actually be decades away. We focus on the novel and we forget to maintain the things that we already have. And by consequence, the people who maintain them. Well, yeah, that's exactly the point. You know, one of the reasons I think the episode we did on emerging technologies in wood-based materials resonated so much, there's a little pulpy pun for people there, um, is because it's an innovation that can actually be used by the maintainers. It's something that's tangible. It's something that can be shared. And it's a material that will be used by the same builders, craftsmen, architects and engineers who are currently using concrete and brick. It won't be replacing them. But surely that's an example of innovation and existing skills combining. 
It is, but it's one of the few examples. Um, look at the traditional media industry, for example. It's been decimated by the social media companies. Uh, newspapers closing for uh, want of, uh, you know, buyers mm. um, because readers can get free information online and advertisers who can get feedback and target their digital buys much more closely than a newspaper can get can give them. Uh, TV networks are increasingly reworking their content, especially news, into bite-sized chunks for streaming video. Uh, Radio stations competing with podcasts for audience share. And there's nothing wrong with any of these things, uh, especially to those of you listening to this on podcast. (laughs) We love you. We really do. Um, But a digital-only media is a delicate one. You know, Mm. printing presses have served us well for over 500 years for a reason. Uh, You can take them back to a model that doesn't rely on electricity. And not to mention the diversion of the money that pays for the content. Well, exactly that. You know, okay, channel hopping on the TV and arranging your schedule around broadcast Mm. times was irritating at times. But how often do you sit there scrolling through your favorite streaming services, complaining that there's nothing to watch? Every single time. Every, yeah, almost every night, right. Um, and everyone waits for Friday when the drop of new episodes comes. Um, before doing um, what I do, which is to watch a terrible auction-based reality show uh, from Canada, um, you know, having 100 channels on the dial may have been too much to manage. But is it really a better alternative to dial that back to just one or two networks who have mm. the ability to control all our news, movies, shows, And of course, the music we consume. All right. After the break, we will celebrate the maintainers. BFM 89.9. Blues, folk, metal. BFM 89.9. And we're back. It is MSP together with Matt Armitage from Culture Pop. Before the break, uh, Matt, you were laying out a case that we're too focused on innovation. What are some of the drawbacks of this focus? Well, let's go back to the antibiotics. Mm. Uh, Very often we focus on that disruptive angle of innovation. Developing new antibiotics is a long, tedious process that probably won't be particularly profitable. Much better for a pharmaceutical company to concentrate its resources towards a new cancer treatment, something that's going to make headlines. Maybe it'll get someone nominated for a Nobel Prize. Mm. And of course, it can then be priced to make back its research costs and make the company a healthy profit. Isn't that where the public sector should step in? Well, yes, it should. But, you know, again, using antibiotics, let's say I'm the Prime Minister of Malaysia and uh, I make an announcement that I'm going to commit 10 billion US dollars a year to help develop new strains of antibiotics and that we should see some results within 15 to 20 years. Mm. But the chances are I don't have 15 to 20 years ahead of me as Prime Minister. Well, you probably don't have 20 years ahead of you, full stop. Uh, That's mean, it's (laughs) unnecessary, and most hurtfully, it's probably true. Um, So, you know, every year of my premiership run, Mm. I'll be committing that $10 million without any expectation of a reward for me or my party, the Matservatives. Um, (laughs) You know, that's fine. I, Mm. I can do that because... I don't particularly care about being popular, but (laughs) how many actual politicians can say that? Mm. How many can commit to such long-term development goals? Maybe they think, okay, if I spend 10 billion on mosquito uh, eradication, maybe I can make a massive and relatively short-term impact on those mosquito-borne infections. Uh, I'll do some good and I can boost my re-election chances. Okay, but play that out in a pure tech scenario, something that might be easier to visualise. Okay, um, this is probably even harder to visualize, <laughs> visualize, but let's say I'm a really good programmer. Mm-hmm. I'm not. And I go off to a big social media company in Silicon Valley. I get a big fat salary. I get stock options. I get benefits. And I get this amazing place to work in. So, you know, yay for me. I've made it. My dream job. Every day I help to devise better technologies to uh, keep everyone's eyeballs on the site, maximizing the advertiser revenues that are paying for, you know, my sweet life. Great. The company pays for my travel costs. I Uber in from 50 kilometers away every day because the local public transport network is creaking under the strain. Mm -hmm. Of course, me and my colleagues could help to code them an incredible state-of-the-art transport management system, but of course, they can't afford our salaries. And you want to ask which is more important, the tech startup or the transport network? Well, it's kind of obvious, really, isn't it? Um, And if you say the startup, then you are 
a terrible person. Um, but there's a limit to the wages, the salaries that the public sector can can pay. For one thing, it's taxpayers' money. Mm. Um, for another, it would mean that I would be getting paid more than the president. And that's how the disruption from innovation ripples. That's not to say that the public sector is staffed by second-rate people. A lot of people choose to go into that life because they understand the social and societal value of the work they're doing. But there's still a very large distortion effect going on. And that may be hampering innovation in existing industries. Yeah, for example, I think there was a story we covered on Geeks a few weeks ago about a rural community in Canada or the US partnering with one of the rideshare companies to immigrate, uh, integrate rather yeah. their services into the local public transport network. So in theory, it's a good solution. The municipality would subsidize a percentage of the rideshare fares. Money is going back into the pockets of local drivers to fuel the local economy. So it makes it economic to serve people in places where maybe regular bus or train services would struggle because of the geography and or the cost. Mm. And how does this fit into your maintenance disruptive narrative? Because why do we need the rideshare company? <laughs> because of the app and the expertise? Well, is that true or do we just assume it's true because we've bought into the vision of innovation that those companies represent? It's a bit like the generic drugs argument. Um, why can't we have generic versions of apps? Why doesn't the central government develop an app that can be shared with this kind of rural municipality to help them with their transport needs. Mm. It's not like governments aren't used to running databases and vetting people. You know, sometimes that seems like pretty much they all do. <laughs> and what would that achieve? Well, you'd get lower fares because there's no middleman. So fare subsidies, which again is taxpayer money, mm -hmm. that could be reduced. Fares could be reduced to the end user. And the returns to the drivers, because they could be receiving 100% of the fare, could also be increased. Uh, it's the same as... a any business engaging a third party, you have to ask what expertise the third party brings. Mm -hmm. If it turns out that developing, maintaining and updating the app isn't cost effective, then fine, bring the rideshare company in. But don't just pick up the phone because you've bought the disruption and innovation hype. We have to maintain our own control of these narratives, you know, for our own sake. A cryptocurrency? Well, yeah, like when a certain social media company told us that their <laughs> cryptocurrency would be the solution to hundreds of millions of the world's unbanked inhabitants and would give them access to financial services. Problem is, those things are true, but they're true of the technology, mm. blockchain, not the platform, whatever its name might be. <laughs> um, if global financial empowerment... Uh, you know, really was that particular company's ambition, it could pour some of its impressive cash reserves into existing schemes, which could actually be tailor-made to suit local requirements mm. uh, and therefore be, you know, a bit more fit for purpose. It's not necessary for that company's name to be on the masthead of that revolution uh, or to exercise any control over the network in order to get that done. Championing a decentralized financial network and then putting your vast company at the center of that network is a little bit odd. So how does this bring us back to us? Okay, so within the maintainer's website, I mentioned that there's an element of networking. Mm -hmm. uh, disruptive innovation is diverting resources. So we may not be seeing the full extent of the innovation and information sharing that we sh could be seeing in the 99.9% .9 of the world that isn't a tech startup. Uh, that information aspect is very important because a lot of the innovation that is funded is IP protected. Mm. And that's fine. You know, you want to protect your investment. But that actually stamps down on innovation. For example, you know, a piece of protected blockchain code in a cryptocurrency could be the key to enabling homeless people in a city or district to find shelter for the night or to get long-term housing solutions. So I understand the profit incentive. There's no requirement to share that code with competitors. But why stop charities or public bodies from making use of it? But we forget that so many aspects of our daily lives don't have a profit incentive, like traffic lights mm. and public parks. All right, but let's not get confused with the quiet maintainers and the activists. No, absolutely. Um, every time a show like this features some company like Juicero, the <laughs> solution to a juice problem no one ever had, uh, they take the focus away from more deserving people. Mm. 
bank clerks, managers, waiting staff, security guards, designers, ad execs, sales reps. You know, you kind of get the point. As we said um, earlier, um, it's not really we, it's it's you, you know, the people who go out to work every day, not in a glamorous office with free candy and electric scooters to take you between meeting rooms, but the people who are actually doing the hard work of making the world turn. And it can also mean that the money that funds big salaries in that innovation sector is actually flowing away from the sectors you work in. So it can potentially create a distortion effect that deprives you of salary raises, benefits, or better working conditions. And there's a psychological effect there. I think there has to be. You mm. know, this, the idea that you're of no value to society unless you're a Bill Gates or an Elon Musk. Mm. Uh, and I don't think either of those people would agree with that either, by the way. But, um, but when you see the way innovation is praised and how much the status quo – there, I finally said it um, – how much the status quo uh, is undervalued, then you start to see how biased the system is in favor of anything that's new. Why do you always end with things that sound like a conspiracy theory? Because it was the giant <laughs> lizards that done it. Um, they operate from a pizza restaurant in Klang from where the world economy is actually controlled. You think it's coincidence that these reptilian space aliens live along one of the world's most important shipping routes? I'm genuinely speechless. Well, it's not a conspiracy. It's <laughs> something we're doing to ourselves, mm. partly because we don't see ourselves as being important components in the machine. And we forget how interrelated those machine parts are. So somebody waiting on a table or cooking in a kitchen probably doesn't think about the role they play in enhancing or maintaining the productivity of the workers that pass through their doors at lunchtime. Uh, not just in terms of refueling them, but in terms of their enjoyment of the food, giving them the chance to speak to colleagues and friends outside the office. You know, all these little interactions have these knock-on effects and benefits. Which, when you scale it up, it's a global machine containing billions of people. Yeah, exactly. Um, we are, or rather you all are, the people <laughs> who makes the innovation possible. You may not personally be the innovators, but it's your hard work that maintains the system that very often those innovators are trying to disrupt. So yes, Bill Gates has done amazing things. Mm -hmm. In some ways, you could say that Microsoft was his kind of lucky break, but that the real innovation has been in Gates's philanthropy, uh, which takes an army of people to implement and maintain. And it's these people who deliver the results and maintain the world who are the real heroes, because they aren't doing it for glory or fame. Um, what's that line from uh, Pink Floyd's time? Ticking away the moments that make up a dull day. Mm. And that's what takes real courage. Not taking a Wi-Fi enabled bus to a playground office where there's free food, free laundry and cubbies for you to nap in. The hard part is maintaining the world for the people who are going to come after. There we go. Talking about uh, forgetting the innovators and uh, maintainers are actually the real heroes. Uh, next Friday, though, we do have a special. We are doing an AMA series, which is Ask Matt Anything. Yeah, we will be live. <laughs> um, the topic is the future. So anything you want to know about the future, it could be about work, health, uh, love. cryptocurrencies, <laughs> love, <laughs> finance. Yeah, if you want to find out if you'll be marrying a robot. Do call in, WhatsApp, uh, Twitter, Twitter, yeah. uh, and we will be answering your questions live. I say we because I'm going to be relying on Jeff as well, and uh, he's going to have his yeah. fast fingers uh, on Google. <laughs> yeah, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we will have Geek Squawks after this, BFM 89.9. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.